At the beginning of April 2000, a magazine called Africa Confidential and the Sunday Times of London broke the story that a well-known Nigerian soccer player named John Fashionu had issued a report. This report claimed that Bob Minton was involved in a massive multi-billion dollar Nigerian debt buyback scam between the years of 1988 and 93. It wasn't until weeks after the story ran that a journalist called Bob Minton to ask if this was true. Bob told him the Fashion New report was completely false and he had documents to prove it. The Nigerian Democratic Movement in the United States offered to sponsor a public forum in which to debate the Fashionu report. Shall we go in? John Fashionu agreed to attend the debate along with the investigator behind his report, Rob Clark. Subsequently, Rob Clark was revealed to be actually David Lee, an investigator hired by the Church of Scientology. Bob Minton arrived on schedule for the debate. Fashionu and his investigator never appeared. Over the period, we hear that our Nigerian government has tried to do everything, a number of things, to try and reduce the debt. Debt buyback, debt conversion, <coughs> refusal to pay their debts, curtailing debts, and so on. And so uh, I know that Nigerians as a whole are very keen on finding out about our debt situation. <coughs> Whether we owe these debts at all, why we owe them, why we have not paid, and whether there are those who have said they have helped us pay have actually contributed in increasing that very debt. So I have said that one of those indications of bad leadership has been the fact of the debt, debts themselves. The other issue has been the one of loot, of looting of our treasure. We have heard quite a lot about looting of our country in terms of inflated contracts, <coughs> contracts that were issued but never done, and so on. But never have we heard until recently about what the Vice President Atiku Abibuka called direct steals. So both the debt and the debt and the and loot recovery have become big issues in our country. Of course, the one that has generated the most amount of information in recent times has what has been called the Fashion Report on the <coughs> debt buyback. So there are a number of allegations going on about the fact that even the very effort of the Nigerian government in trying to reduce its debt through this particular scheme that some would characterize as a scam if you don't know much more than it. Um, actually went into increasing the very debt of our country. How did I get involved in this in the first instance? Two years ago, I got a call from one Robert Tom in Canada saying that he had some information about uh, the debt buyback scheme. This was two years ago. He said he was calling from Canada, and could he fly down to talk to me about it? He felt that I was president of the democratic movement. He felt that we would be interested in, in hearing what he had to say. And I said, sure, come along. Two days later, he came, and I asked Mr. Dak Olorioni of the news to attend that meeting with me. And we met him for two hours in the Chemical Engineering Conference Room, and provided us some information about the debt buyback scheme. <coughs> I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a financial guru. I'm just a chemical engineering <coughs> professor. I'm not a reporter. So I turned over all the documents that uh, 
Mr. Robert Clark gave to me to Mr. Dr. Olami Olami. And from then on, they had whatever relationships they had. And I never really spoke with Mr. Robert Clark for the past two years until about three months ago when this issue of the John Fashion Report came about. And since then, we must have had 10 different conversations about the debt buyback scheme. On April 28th, he came to my office and said that his um, investigation of the uh, scheme was almost complete. Complete enough for him to say that he, he thought that the State Department and the <coughs> Internal Revenue Service should know something about it. And um, I've seen some of the documents. I don't know whether it's a complete fashion report. I mean, it's only those who write the report who can know whether it's a complete report. You can only see something and say, it's a report. And I've lived in this country for about 22 years now to know that if somebody tells you that there's a dead body somewhere and you don't report to the police, that's well, you hear there's a dead body somewhere, please investigate. Uh, when in fact a dead body is found and you didn't report, you may be answering to something. So right away I wrote a letter to the State Department and to the Internal Revenue Service telling them what I had been told and passing the information that I had <coughs> to them. About, uh, actually, I would say that April 14th, I would say April 14th, John Fashadu wrote a letter to the Nigerian Democratic Movement in my <coughs> my name, saying that uh, he, he had this information, he was hoping that we would uh, 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 act as really local standing that because we're a Nigerian Democratic Movement, <coughs> since we're in the U.S., he was hoping that we would be interested in it. That was uh, uh, April 14th. And I said, sure, let's, let's see what you have. And that was followed up April 28th by Mr. Robert Clark's <coughs> visit. And um, so the document was presented. So again, I don't know whether it's the entire document. All this period, of course, the name Mr. Robert Minton had been very much featured in the report. Not his name only. Uh, Jeffrey Schmidt, Bob Smith, a lot of companies, Greenland Holdings, Turan, the whole lot. I mean, if you see some of the numbers, see, to me, I couldn't tell whether there was there's any scam or any fraud. It's just numbers to me. But there is a lot of deals. Four billion dollars, four point four billion dollars, three hundred and twenty-five deals. A lot of interests accrued over a period of time. <coughs> just fat numbers for a Nigerian like myself, especially when I multiply by hundred. <laughs> Four billion dollars is four hundred billion naira. Four hundred billion of anything, even cowrie shells, is a lot of it. So, um, but um, for an American, maybe not much. Because our, our budget this year is only six billion dollars in Nigeria. That of the U.S. is one point eight trillion. So uh, they can pay our budget for the next twenty years, and we're not we're not show up in. in so that is the extent of my own involvement. I have not done a single investigation of my own. Okay? Any, not anything that have come to me have just been passed on. Where does Mr. George Noah come in? I have known Mr. George Noah for three, four years. I think during that period, almost every, and I've only met him twice. This is the third time I've met him. 
But we must have spoken over those four, uh, um, four years. If you multiply 52 times 4, 200 times. Once every week over the radio career. If there is anybody who is involved <coughs> in, in making sure that Radio Kudirat ran for four years, Judge Noah is one of those. <laughs> Once a week he called my home, I gave my own commentary, not in my name. <laughs> 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 That, that was what happened for four years. But he also writes for the news. And I believe, and I, I was not the one that introduced this scheme to you. Not at all. So uh, you will have to tell your own story as to how you got it. But uh, um, George is, has a BSc in political science from the University of Ghana. After Went to school in Nigeria. He went abroad and became a public relations officer for one of the Alumni City Councils. But now runs his own consulting. He's a publisher of Nigerian News Online, uh, Nigeria Today. And uh, as a, he, he continues to work with uh, Radio Program. So, George, welcome. I guess. I've never been close to a millionaire before. <laughs> so Mr. Bob Minton does not, he's not, he's a, I think he's a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, used, he says he used to be. Okay, we'll, we'll take him. <laughs> he has, he, he's, a, he's 54 years old. And he's um, a retired investment banker. He has a BS in finance and economics from the University of Tennessee uh, in 1970, he says. I've heard a lot about him, especially in relation to uh, the, 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 the debt buyback scheme. He currently is chairman of the board of the Lisa McPherson Trust, which is a watchdog group that focuses on Scientology, on the Church of Scientology. And that is based in Clearwater, Florida. All through the years that uh, we have been, I had heard about the dead guy vaccine, his name had always featured. And uh, we have his name, address, phone number, everything about him. But uh, we, I mean, as I said, I wasn't really investigating anything. So I didn't call him. I didn't do anything. And we had not really heard anything about him at all until about, what, two weeks ago. We got an email, or you got an email, that said, he wrote to me and said, Bob Minton replies or speaks or something like that. That was the first email we ever got from, from him. Not to us, but apparently he was responding to some um, write-up in some, uh, uh, some Nigerian, some, some medium, some medium. So that, that picked our interest. Yeah, and we actually saw his his email address. But of course, anybody can be Bob Minton at something that art, you know, and who knows whether it's he. But in one of the responses, and so George and I spoke a number of times, and we said, well, this guy says he's Bob Minton. We, did, we don't really know whether he's Bob Minton. I mean, you can't know whether somebody is Bob Minton unless you, you know the, the person. But in one of the emails, there was a write-up that matched with one other write-up that we had. And we felt that that indicated to us that that was Bob Minton. And from then on, we decided to contact him. Then we said that we were going to have this public forum. And we weren't sure whether he would attend. 
have called, we have talked with uh, Ambassador Fashanu, and we have given an indication we will be able to attend. We have talked with uh, Mr. Robert Clark, we are excited about it. So we went ahead and contacted Mr. Bob Lynch, and lo and behold, he said he was coming. So we were in a binder, so why was he coming? And we, we didn't know he would come. But here he is. Uh, Mr. Robert Clark, or his representative, <coughs> are not here. Ambassador Fashanu and his representative are not here yet. So we still have a space for them in case they come. I know that in the past two days they have indicated that uh, they under legal advice they might not attend. I've indicated to them that we would hope that they would attend because they have the right not to speak or to speak or to question Mr. Bobbitton if he's here. But so I still have the space available to them. At this stage, I'm going to pass the chair, chair uh, the, the speech on to Mr. George Noah. Following with Mr. Bob Smith will speak. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bob Minton will speak, I'm sorry. And then we'll open it up to some questions and answers from the floor. Some people have indicated to me that they know a little bit more than I know about this, so I hope you will ask some questions from the floor. But I will take the privilege of asking a few questions before the rest of the people. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. Um, when I had a discussion with the, the professor that um, it's necessary to have some kind of a public forum to look into these issues, um, we uh, objective was to um, get the principal actors or the, the, the those involved in the controversy to come into the open and to tell us exactly what it's all about. Um, let me try and go into how I got involved with this thing. As the professor men mentioned, um, I do write for the news once in a while. And on this occasion in April, I got a call from um, Bayo Nanuga, the editor of the news, and said, um, George, um, there was a report that um, appeared in the Sunday Times in London, um, which featured um, Fasha Nun talking about a um, um, scam perpetrated by um, some people who took part in the Nigerian dead by scheme. And it's, you know, he wanted to find out if I could um, do an interview with Fashion for his uh, publication. So I said, why not? So I called um, Fashion and uh, told him I wanted to interview him. The first interview I did was by telephone. And I think it must have gone on for about um, two hours. The second interview. Um, after the first one, um, I actually did it with my colleague, Daryl Johnson, and that took about uh, five about five hours. And in that interview, I met um, a gentleman called uh, Robert Clark, who said he was a uh, fashion news special investigator. Now, in writing about this debt bar bike scheme, um, most of what I've, what, I've, what I've done is to present the information which um, Fashion New and its investigators um, passed on to me. And um, there are three things which we've talked about. One is that international banks were involved in um, perpetrating some financial crimes. Um, foreigners were involved. But um, the only foreigner they talked about was Mr. Minton. They also um, were not willing to talk about the Nigerians because if you say a foreigner worked with the Nigerian government and um, perpetrated financial crimes, um, there's no way Nigerians will not be involved. <laughs> now, they were unwilling to talk about the Nigerians 
who were supposed to be involved. So what I did was to present their information. And I was hoping that um, so at some stage, I'll be able to have a discussion with Mr. Minton to get his own side of the story. And luckily, as the professor men mentioned, I was surfing through the net one day and I came across <coughs> um, something which uh, Mr. Minton had posted on the net. And, you know, got his uh, email address. I spoke with the professor. I said, you know, this can't be true. Um, and he said, why don't you contact him? So I sent an email to Mr. Minton. And I think he must probably must have been surprised because the reply I got back was, and who are you? <laughs> <laughs> because my note to him was um, very straightforward. Um, could you please um, respond to you know, the allegations about you know, the death part by him? And as I mentioned, he said, and who are you? So I replied. And I sent him um, uh, Nigeria Today Online back issues to let him know exactly um, what I do, and also the report which I did for the news. So after that, Mr. Minton replied. Um, he gave his own side of the story, but um, not very comprehensive, but with the intention that at some stage I would sit down face to face with him and do um, a detailed interview. That interview has been done, and um, I'm just in the process of um, tidying it up to forward it to the news um, and also to use on Nigeria today. So the purpose of um, having this public forum when I you know, had a chat with the professor was, look, we've heard so much about this. The general public wants to know exactly what this is all about. So we thought the best opportunity was to give those um, who have been um, accusing or denying allegations to come into the open and to give their own side of the story. So that's mainly why um, the professor organized this uh, session. And immediately we decided on that. Um, I called um, um, Fashion and told him this is what was going on. And he said, why not? That, you know, he was you know, very excited. You know. That's you know, anywhere, if it's um, in Austria or in Germany or in London or the United States, I'll be there. And uh, shortly after that, um, when we fixed the date for, the, for this forum, I got a call from him. And he said he was somewhere in Uganda. And I said, but you're going to talk about this um, uh, forum, and he said um, he was uh, going to return to England next week, Wednesday. Well, I said, you know, I said, well, we agree that you're going to take part in this forum, and I thought this would be an opportunity for you to um, face Mr. Minton and put all these allegations <coughs> across to him. And he said he was involved in um, other matters, and that he wouldn't be back. Um, in London till next week, Wednesday. And I thought maybe um, it was a joke uh, because the enthusiasm with which um, he responded the first time I spoke to him about this um, gave me reasons to believe that he would actually turn up. And I was quite surprised when he gave the impression that he wouldn't be able to turn up. Um, as the professor mentioned, he would like to ask some questions. Um, I have some questions as well. I have asked some, you know, some of these questions um, when I met Mr. Minton. Um, but I, would, I think since we've called this forum, I would like to ask these questions. Now, some of these questions, I, I would ask them after Mr. Minton has made his own um, uh, submission. Um, but some of these questions were the questions which um, Mr. Fashenu and his investigator, um, you know, actually said any time I get into contact with Mr. Minton, I should put it across to him. 
So even though they're not here, um, I would like to ask these questions. Initially, I thought, look, if these guys are not here, um, and if I'm to put these sort of questions to Mr. Minton, um, it may be unfair because the guys who are making the allegations um, are not going to be cross-examined, as Mr. Minton is going to be cross-examined here by myself and members of the public who are here. But I thought, look, we should try and put all these matters in the public domain. And as a result, I decided I was going to ask this question. So um, after Mr. Minton has made his um, submissions, I'll put the questions which Mr. Fashanu and his private investigator want answered. So that's how I got involved with this um, reporting on this uh, this controversial issue, and uh, it's not the issue is not dead. Uh, as I mentioned, I've done a meeting with Mr. Meeting, and I shall be putting that um, across to the news magazine for them to publish, just as Mr. Fashanu and his investigators um, have had an opportunity to do. Thanks. First, uh, just let me ask a question. Uh, I have a fairly uh, good voice that carries throughout a small room, and I think this room is small enough. I have a, a computer here and lots of things on the table. If nobody would mind, I'd be happy to sit here if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> well, I think all three of us qualify. <laughs> there, there has been a green packet to, that's been sitting around, and, and quite a few people here in the audience have picked one up. Uh, many of you don't have one. Um, we're going to temporarily, uh, if I can borrow two of those, no, you, you hang on to it, I'll give you a, these are two packs for, four packs for the media people, but in the meantime you can borrow these and I can give you copies uh, later. But I am, uh, by giving this documentation to you, I am uh, intentionally uh, violating my agreement with the Central Bank of Nigeria to keep this information in confidence. I am, I am doing so in an attempt to make transparent the uh, events between 1988 and 1993 in this debt buyback uh, activity that myself and Jeff Schmidt were involved in on behalf of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, for those of you who did not get one of these uh, green packages, I have uh, another handout here which is a, uh, called the Sources and Uses of Funds Statement. Anybody who would like to get one of those, I think we might have enough to cover anybody. There's one in the green package already. Essentially, if, you, if you're able to understand what is on this Sources and Uses of Funds Statement, by the time we finish, you will actually understand very well what, uh, what this debt buyback scheme uh, did and what it was all about. Now, just as a little bit of background here while we're passing those out, I was uh, an international banker. Uh, I worked for Wells Fargo Bank in uh, San Francisco and in New York. And in 1979, I decided to uh, leave international banking and set up uh, my own company to pursue uh, what was in fact the first uh, major international debt trading operation to take place in the, in the sort of modern era of debt trade. And this was in uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey had gotten into similar problems that Nigeria later got into. And what happened is uh, a large amount of uh, trade credits where, where, where goods were shipped into Turkey, uh, the local company in Turkey could pay his Turkish lira. Uh, the Turkish lira would be transferred from the local Turkish bank to the central bank, and the central bank was obligated to transfer the foreign exchange to the exporter in Germany or Switzerland or wherever. The central bank ran out of money, and this is similar to what happened in Nigeria with the trade credits, and subsequently those trade credits were rescheduled in 1984 and 1988 by the central bank in Nigeria who issued promissory notes to document the evidence of indebtedness to those foreign companies who had shipped and didn't get paid. 
So I started this in Turkey in 1979. Uh, two years later, uh, in Brazil and Mexico, the same problems happened. Uh, you know, the <coughs> Brazil and Mexico stopped paying their debt. There was a big international crisis. Uh, Citibank and Walter Riston, who was the president of Citibank at the time, uh, was the first to admit that the debts that these that these third world countries had incurred, which were being carried on the books of international banks, were not worth 100 cents on the dollar, and they started writing off substantial amounts of, of international debts in, in Brazil, Argentina, uh, Ecuador, Chile, uh, Indonesia, and everywhere else in the world. Well, given this kind of environment that I had been in, obviously I had some knowledge of, uh, of debt trading, uh, some knowledge of international banking, and in 1987, uh, I was involved in a, a business in London with a company called GML International, uh, who, who in fact started doing this debt buyback business in Nigeria. But we met, uh, I met a guy uh, named Jeff Schmidt, and Jeff Schmidt was at the time uh, working for uh, Lehman Brothers, now uh, it was changed later to Shearson Lehman Brothers, and now I don't even know what it's called anymore, but Lehman Brothers was one of three institutions involved in advising third world debt uh, countries on their debt management programs. This was uh, Lehman, uh, Lehman Brothers in New York, Lazard's in Paris, and uh, S.G. Warburg in London, three major uh, international uh, financial powerhouses they had a unit which was called the Troika, which dealt with uh, advising third world countries on how to handle and manage their debt problems, which were, obviously, they were working for people who had significant problems. Well, Jeff, uh, because of uh, when he was uh, growing up in the United States, he, he joined the Peace Corps after he got out of college. He went and he lived in Africa for several years, uh, mostly in Mali, but he had uh, spent a lot of time in Nigeria as well. Jeff was handling uh, Africa for Lehman Brothers and for this Troika. Well, <clears throat> the company that I was involved in, GML International, we had a situation in Romania. And this may be a little bit tedious, but I'm going to get to Nigeria right now. We, the Romanian government was in the process of trying to uh, liquidate some of its external debt. And one of the debts they had was an indebtedness to uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria, or to NNPC, I guess it was, for oil that had been shipped to Romania by Nigeria. And it had not been paid for almost four years. But the Romanians wanted to pay this debt off at a big discount, obviously. And we were working with the Romanian government at the time, and we said, well, uh, we know some people who uh, have involvement uh, in Africa, and we'll We'll get back to you and let you know what we can do. And we went. To, we were doing a lot of business with what at the time it was Shearson Lehman Brothers, and their debt trading people told us that uh, there was a gentleman working for them named Jeff Schmidt who had uh, very very good contacts in Nigeria. They explained that Jeff had been involved in the central bank's rescheduling of the trade debts back in 1984, which resulted in the first group of promissory notes issued by the central bank, and also. Uh, later, uh, he became, uh, he was involved in the 1987-88 rescheduling of those debts as well, on the, uh, as an advisor to the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, Jeff, in fact, uh, did uh, handle the Nigerian side of this particular business with Romania. Uh, he dealt directly with the, the Central Bank. Uh, we had no contact with the Central Bank at that stage, but we developed a very uh, close uh, friendship, uh, Jeff and I, and in fact, uh, one of the strange things about Jeff and I is, uh, since, I, since, since Jeff and I have uh, gone different ways now, I've probably put on a little bit more weight than he, he has, but people used to say that Jeff and I were twins. Uh, I mean, we really <coughs> did look alike. Uh, my son, uh, who's now he's 28, uh, the three of us would be together walking down the streets and people would think we were all, uh, you know, brothers. So, in any case, Jeff and I had a very close relationship, and he certainly, in later years, became my very best and closest friend. Um, well, Jeff had talked uh, many times to the governor of the central bank, uh, uh, Governor Ahmed, 
and obviously he was very close uh, with Governor Ahmed, and Governor Ahmed had talked with him about the possibilities of a, of a debt buyback operation. Uh, Governor Ahmed had been talked to by Citibank quite extensively about doing such a business. Uh, there was a woman at Citibank by the name of Martha Mueller who frequently traveled to Nigeria. She talked to the governor on a regular basis and began to tell the governor that large amounts of, of uh, Central Bank of Nigeria promissory notes were available at 16 to 18 cents on the dollar. And the governor was, of course, very interested in this. And he discusses with Jeff. Um, Citibank was not exactly flavor of the month for central banks anywhere in the world at the time because the Citibank had seized in late 1987 uh, an account of the Central Bank of Ecuador. And this was a, a, a fairly uh, a nasty thing for uh, an international bank like Citibank to do. And it got people very concerned. Central Bank uh, governors and you know their foreign exchange managers, et cetera, are quite concerned about the attitude of these international banks, particularly Citibank, who was very aggressive in seizing assets to try to uh, collect debts that hadn't been paid. Not an unreasonable thing to do, but something that would be terribly uh, of concern to a central bank governor. Well, whatever reason uh, Governor Ahmed decided to do business with us, the main reason behind his decision to do business with Jeff Schmidt, myself, and there was a third partner named Selwyn Lewis, whose name is not uh, often mentioned, but uh, was mentioned in the early days of the talks about this fashion report. Well, the governor decided to do this business with us because he trusted Jeff Schmidt, who he had known for at least six years, who had been a close and intimate advisor. He didn't know me. At the time when he decided to do this business, he had not even met me. Uh, Selwyn Lewis went to uh, Nigeria with Jeff Schmidt. They talked about this program with Governor Ahmed, uh, and it was mutually agreed that we were going to enter into uh, a contract with the central bank on, on terms that were agreed to enter into a debt buyback program of, for the central bank of Nigeria. And amongst this, uh, these this green package. You will see uh, about six or seven pages into it, maybe more than that. You will see a contract there between, her, between Greenland Holdings, a name that you've heard mentioned today, and the Central Bank of Nigeria, which set out the original terms on which we were going to do this buyback program for the Central Bank of Nigeria. It's the, the, the principal things on this contract that I wanted to point out to you is point number two, says in order to purchase the debt in the most confidential manner, manner possible, Greenland has made an agreement with Osterishi Lander Bank, AG, London Branch. And henceforth, I won't refer to them as Osterishi Lander Bank because they subsequently changed their name, thank God, to Bank Austria. Uh, this bank, bank, uh, bank Austria, at the time, and probably they still are, I don't know, they were owned 100% by the city of Vienna uh, in Austria. It is a, a, a triple-A rated bank, uh, one of the most prestigious banks in Europe because of the ownership by the city of Vienna. Uh, some people have cast aspersions on their role in this, in this debt buyback, but I can assure you that uh, Bank Austria is one of the finest financial institutions in Europe. And we had a very, very close, and I say we, the company that Jeff Schmidt, uh, Selwyn Lewis, and I were involved in, Selwyn and I, before Jeff got involved, had had a long-term relationship with these people. They had done huge amounts of business with us, and they were a natural party for us to uh, have as, a, as an assistant, really, for doing this Nigeria business. Now, the second point. Sorry, um, um, the signature to that is one Mr. Jero Shonoiki. That's correct. The director of Foreign Operations, just for those who do not have a copy of it. Yes. The other, the other point, number 10, Greenland's compensation will result from the difference between the purchase price of the debt and the all-in cost of the debt to the Greenland account. 
Greenland. Yes, number 10. What's that? No, no, it's on the second page of that contract. It's point number 10. Each, each paragraph is a number. Yeah, it says Greenland will cover all expenses, including lawyers' fees and OLB fees. OLB is Bank Austria. Net profit to Greenland will be approximately 1% of the face value of the debt. Now, <clears throat> before we get into the profit, let me just tell you that 1% of $4.5 billion is $45 million. So, uh, you know, it's not a big profit, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> The reason I mention that 1% is because a, a really, Jeff Schmidt told me a really interesting story recently, and, and uh, Mr. Noah, I think, has been able to confirm this. Uh, uh, President uh, Obasanjo actually went to General Babangida at the time of this debt buyback operation that was going on and offered to do, he was working together with Shearson Lehman Brothers, who Jeff Schmidt had left, and the two people that first introduced us to Jeff Schmidt together with, uh, I guess it was, he was General uh, Obasanjo then, or had been and retired, I'm not sure what his position was at that time in 1989 or beginning of 1990. But he offered to do this debt buyback business to General Babangida for 1% of the face value of the debt. So this is not to, you know, yes, $45 million to anybody is a lot of money. and. Uh, you know, but when you hear, uh, as we go on through the course of this afternoon, when you hear what we have done, uh, and and you hear it painted uh, in the picture that I want you to see, as opposed to the picture that someone else wanted you to see, I think you will see that Nigeria got extraordinarily good value for that forty-five million dollars. So there are uh, there in this green package. After that sources and uses of fund statement, there is a complete list of all 325 deals that were done. The, the names of the uh, party, the counterparty that we purchased the debt from is in there. Uh, you know, it's, it's there for the world to see and the prices that we charge to the Central Bank of Nigeria are there for the world to see. Now, one of the, one of the beauties of any sort of true market is that, especially uh, uh, any sort of financial market, in this case an international debt market, the pricing is basically transparent because during the course of this five years, 1988 to 1993, I'm sitting there at my desk looking at a Reuters screen quoting the price of Nigeria, Romania, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Chile, you know, every country's debt is quoted right there. You know, you can, one of the outstanding falsities in the Fashion New Report is that Minton and his crowd bought this debt at 20 cents on the dollar and turned around and sold it for 60 cents on the dollar to the Central Bank of Nigeria. The prices are here. The average price that the government of Nigeria played, paid for the uh, $4.5 billion worth of debt is 34 cents on the dollar. It's, it's here. Uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria has these reports. They've had reports on a monthly basis from 1988 to 1993 in March when we finished this operation for, this, for the Central Bank that shows every penny received, every penny spent, the prices of all the debt, and the all-in price to Nigeria was not 60 cents on the dollar. It was 34 cents on the dollar. The exact percentage, 34.125 or whatever is listed in here. So we can, we can forget about this myth that Minton and his gang made 40 cents on the dollar. Now, you have read about the, I'm, coming, I'm, I'm sticking with this, but just to, for a second, you saw what happened when Abacha was running Nigeria. He did a deal with his son, his own son, 
you know, and his son buys this debt from uh, Russia at 20 cents on the dollar, I believe it was, and sells it to Nigeria at 60 cents on the dollar. That was, in fact, a scam. We, uh, you know, the gov Governor Ahmed, Jeff and I went to Governor Ahmed many times during this period, 1988 to 1993, and said, is there anything we can do with this Ajakuta debt? Governor Ahmed finally told us, he said, look, everything to do with that debt is so dirty that you should stay away from it completely. Don't have anything to do with it. He never wanted to talk about it. He said it would cause so many problems in Nigeria to deal with that debt, and he told us to stay away from that debt. And I think in retrospect, after we've seen what's happened, that was good advice. Now, Governor Ahmed, I want to say a little bit about, because he has been disparaged greatly in this fashion and report. And Governor Ahmed is one of the uh, he was one of the finest human beings that I ever met. He, he cared about his country. Yes, he worked for a military dictatorship, but Governor Ahmed cared about Nigeria. What he did, what he did always, to, to, with regards to me and this debt buyback and his attitude, he always had Nigeria, Nigeria's best interest in his heart, and it was obvious. He was a very devout Muslim. Uh, you know, you, you, you read about, uh, you know, there are a lot of very devout Muslims, but, you know, Governor Ahmed would come to the United States, he sits down in our office, and five times a day he would go into a conference room and, and do his prayers. He really did it. You know, wherever he was, he'd do it in Washington when he was at the IMF meeting, he'd do it when he was at our office. You know, he was a, a good, decent man, and I think for John Fashionu and his investigators to have uh, uh, slandered Governor Ahmed is a is something that is unforgivable because he was a really good man who had Nigeria's interest at heart. So I just wanted to say that about the governor. Um, so what we'll do is go over this sources and uses of funds statement because it's a... Could you explain in a few words what a debt buyback scheme itself is? Okay. Uh, having been involved in it, I just sort of automatically assume that everybody knows this type of thing, but uh, what happened in this particular case is, you know, Nigeria, Nigeria got into deep financial difficulties because of this debt problem. And they stopped paying their debts. Arrears were building up on, when, when I say their debts, the type of debts that I'm talking about here, first, the promissory notes that were rescheduled due to the trade debts, and secondly, on their bank debt, this was debt owed to international banks throughout the world. They stopped paying interest and they stopped paying principal. Arrears built up, uh, and the banks who were holding that debt started writing off portions of that debt because they knew that it wasn't collectible at, at face value, so they started making provisions. Later, the debt started trading in modest volumes in, in the secondary market, and for Nigeria, this was an opportunity to go into the international markets and acquire their debt with reserves at cheap prices. In other words, for example, let's say you have a, a mortgage on your house here in the United States and you've uh, issued a, a note to your bank and, you know, they hold the first mortgage, uh, but they, you just, you got to be too much trouble for them. You didn't pay your bills on time, you didn't send in your monthly, you weren't sending in your tax payments to, for the property and, you know, they sold it off to somebody else and they sold it at a discount. And so all of a sudden you're sitting there one day and you hear, in a, in a perfect free market economy, you, you know, you're going to have perfect information. So you hear, hey, my debt's trading at 50 cents on the dollar. I can pay off my mortgage at 50 cents on the dollar if I go out and buy it in the secondary market. Now, that's what a debt buyback is. Uh, you know, it, it only makes sense. There, there are a couple of conditions that are precedent to, to making any sense for a government to go into a debt buyback operation. Number one, they have to have the intent to pay. 
principal and interest. So for Nigeria at the time, the just to use the bank debt because it's simpler to understand, they were paying approximately 10% per annum interest on the bank debt. And they were, in 1988, paying interest. They started in 1987 paying again, and they're paying in 88. So if the price of that debt in the international markets was, say, 30 cents on the dollar, in three years' time, of just paying interest, you could have bought the debt back with just the interest payments alone. And you, you liquidated 100 cents on the dollar. Nigeria saves the 70 cents. They don't have to pay that principal back. They had basically, they were able to basically, in three years' time, buy back their debt for zero because the interest would have been paid anyway. But only Nigeria knew whether they would pay that interest. Not me, not the banks who held the debt. This was entirely up to Nigeria to determine in the medium term whether they were going to pay those debts. Now, when we structured this, we structured this whole operation in the most secretive manner possible. Now, why did we do that? Well, So if you don't mind, um, if I could just uh, interject. Um, when I had my interview with the um, fashion and investigator, one of the things they accused Mr. Minton of was that the whole you know, debt buyback scheme was done you know, in secret. That's one of the major things which you know, he's been accused of. And I put this question to him when I interviewed him. And I think it's, it, it's, you know, uh, it's an issue. Yeah, so, uh, it's an important issue because, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that as well. But uh, there's been a lot made of the fact that we did this very clandestinely, very secretly, uh, and there was a really good reason to do that. Number one, number one, if we were to have gone out into the international marketplace to buy Nigeria debt that was trading uh, at, say, 25 or 30 cents on a dollar, and, these, and the, the people who held the debt knew that it was the Nigerian government going out and buying the debt, what happens to the price? the price goes up. And it goes up really fast under those circumstances because the issuer of the debt is confirming that the debt is worth more than the market says it's worth because they're willing to buy it at the market price. So from the central bank standpoint, uh, stealth, secrecy, was the most important issue to start with. Now, they could have gone to Citibank or Solomon Brothers or Goldman Sachs, and, and I told you the, some of the problems they had with Citibank, but the other thing that they had a problem with is they had to deal with somebody that they trusted, and they had to deal with somebody who didn't have the financial resources to run the market on Nigeria. Now, what that means is, you know, if, if, I, if I was an unscrupulous business person and I had $100 million when we first started doing this for the Central Bank of Nigeria, hey, I know they're buying their debt back, so the best thing for me to do is go out and invest in it because the price is only going to go up. So, you know, Nigeria picked some poor guys. You know, we weren't poor. We, we made, you know, quite a few million dollars ourselves, Selwyn and I, uh, before then. But they picked people who they trusted and... You know, they never told us that, uh, you know, we didn't want you running the market on us. But it was not in our interest to do it uh, because it would, be, uh, it would be immoral to do it. And we were working with the Central Bank of Nigeria. We did this for five years. You will see some other documentation in here that shows that for an entire five-year period, the Central Bank of Nigeria was very satisfied with what we were doing for them. And they continued to send money month after month after month to a total of over $1.1 billion of Nigeria's reserves in order to conduct this operation. So, so if any, if we'll, we'll get to any questions later, but I just want you to understand that there was a reason for the secrecy, an important reason for the secrecy, and uh, the fact that anybody wants to question it, you know, let them question it, but in a real marketplace, you can't go out and be reckless if you're trying to accomplish buying back the debt at the cheapest possible price to the government of Nigeria. Now, 
this sources and uses a fund statement. As I said, if you can understand what's on this document, you will understand everything about this debt buyback. So I'm going to just go over this uh, real quickly uh, and try to explain this. The, the first source of funds that we got to do this operation was obviously monies that was sent by the Central Bank of Nigeria. You will see uh, as another packet, in another part of the packet here, a bank statement of the Central Bank of Nigeria for, for the entire five years. Every penny that came from the Central Bank of Nigeria and every penny that went to them is listed in here. There is a, a further list in this, uh, in this document which shows the 42 different transfers that the Central Bank of Nigeria have made to, to us in order to conduct this operation for that $1.1 billion worth of cash. I just want to skip over the second item, which is $1.2 billion for a minute, and then I'll come back and explain that at the end. I want to skip over, if you don't mind, the $60 million from the National Nigerian Petroleum Corporation. I'll come back to that later. The income there, which is listed in three parts, totaling $464 million, represents the income on, in other words, the interest paid by Nigeria to us while we're holding the debt for Nigeria. So. Nigeria sent us $1.1 in cash. The debt we were holding that belonged to the Central Bank of Nigeria, because we're holding it in trust for them, we collected $464 million worth of interest that would have gone to the other holders of the debt had we not bought it. It would have still been paid by the Central Bank. So in reality, the two major amounts of money we received from the Central Bank are the $1.1 billion and the 464 million, so about 1.6 billion dollars. Now, why is this sources and uses of the source side of this equation inflated by this 1.2 billion dollar figure? Uh, the one point, when we finished <coughs> buying back the bank debt, the London Club debt, you may have heard it referred to as, these were the syndicated loans that uh, the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria owed to international banks throughout the world. There was no questioning the validity of these loans. These were all huge syndicated loans. They were advertised in the papers. You know, the Central, uh, the Federal Republic got their money and they signed a big loan agreement for $500 million or $200 or $100 million, all of these combined. We bought $3 billion worth of that debt. In February uh, 1992, uh, and, and Throughout the time we're buying this bank debt, this is all leading up to this moment in February 1992, the government of Nigeria finalized an official debt buyback operation through the banking agents, through the London Club group of creditors. And they bought back all of the debt outstanding on a bank debt, London Club debt, for 40 cents on the dollar. Now, we were holding approximately, I'm just giving you round numbers here, we were holding $3 billion worth of bank debt. We tendered that into the buyback, the official buyback, and we received from Citibank, the agent for the government of Nigeria in that buyback operation, $1,205,176,211. On February the 20th, 1992, I believe it was. The very same day, we turned around and paid that back to the Central Bank of Nigeria. The same day. You know, it came from three different sources into our account, and it went to the Bank for International Settlements in Baal, Switzerland, for credit to the Central Bank of Nigeria's account. Now, the Bank for International Settlements in Baal, Switzerland is named in Fashion News Report as one of the organizations involved in a conspiracy against the government of Nigeria stealing money. The Bank for International Settlements in Baal, Switzerland, is the central bank's banker. Throughout the world, every central bank maintains an account with the Bank for International Settlements. It is a, it is a clearinghouse for central banks. The, 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 preposter, the preposterous notion that they were somehow involved in scamming Nigeria is absurd, and to my extent, is just one further 
uh, nail in the coffin of this report, which uh, Fashionu has attached his name to. But that's another matter. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is also named as being complicit in this uh, affair. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the United States government's bank. Well, I mean, it's one of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks in the United States. Uh, again, that's completely ridiculous. So, that, uh, apart from the $60 million on the sources and uses of fund statement, I've tried to explain everything on there with a broad brush. The $60 million is monies that came from the National Nigerian Petroleum Corporation when the central bank did a, uh, a buy-sell agreement with NNPC. And by that, what happened is the central bank needed $60 million when we were in the middle of doing some, some business here. And NNPC, who we were also working with in other areas, they were looking for a good return on their money. So what they did is they bought from the Central Bank of Nigeria under a repurchase agreement $60 million worth of Central Bank of Nigeria promissory notes that we had acquired for the Central Bank of Nigeria. You will see down below in the uses section, the $60 million repurchased from NNPC is there. The deal was closed out. You know, later the Central Bank uh, you know, had, had more money. They paid uh, NNPC, NNPC back. I think this was over a period of two years that this happened. And just above that $60 million on the bottom, you'll see a figure of $14,757,000. Uh, $14, that was the amount of interest that NNPC got on those Central Bank of Nigeria promissory notes while they held them. In other words, everything that was due to the holder of those notes went to NNPC. The Central Bank just got the use of the $60 million. NNPC got the Central Bank of Nigeria promissory notes and they collected all the interest on it. So that covers the, the, the sources. Now just, just to go back to the uses here. And after that, to that yeah, point, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, we could honestly, you know, I lived with this thing for five years. Uh, you know, I was the person who sat in the office every day. I handled all of the debt trading, you know, dealing with the banks on the phone, uh, striking the prices, uh, at getting the documentation, each transaction involved an extensive loan agreement, you know, 20, 50 pages long, depending on the bank you were dealing with or the entity. You know, getting all that documentation done and keeping the records for the central bank and for ourselves. So, you know, I lived with this for a long time, so I could talk for days on this, and I know you don't want to talk all day, so I'm going to just quickly go through this. Time. So, maybe what we could do. Well, just just to get this because the uses here are really important. You know, the thing is the following that I too have looked at some of these documents and it takes a financial group to be able to fully understand. And if we are not careful, there will be uh, a, a, a look as if there's an attempt to snow the public yeah. with facts and figures. I think and please stop me if I'm wrong, just have the moderator now. That there is, I, I think there is some uh, feeling that, yeah, you have some of these numbers right. Can we have some questions asked? Sure. At, at some stage, yeah. so that, because, I, I mean, you've given the figures. I'm quite impressed at the fact that you, you are prepared to give some of these figures down. Uh, but maybe if there's one thing in particular you want to explain, so that we can ask a few questions. Okay, well, yeah. I will quote, yeah. yeah. There are three types of debt that we purchased, and the uses of funds basically is for purchasing the debt. We purchased Central Bank of Nigeria promissory notes to the tune of, uh, I believe it was $1.1 billion worth of Central Bank of Nigeria promissory notes, face value. $3 billion worth of Central, uh, uh, Federal Republic of Nigeria debts to, to international banks through the London Club Group of Creditors, and about $450 million worth of multilateral credits. These were government-to-government -government credits, or, for example, COFAS is the French, well, you would understand here in the United States, Exim Bank, 
We, we bought some Exim Bank type guaranteed paper that was rescheduled under the Paris Club arrangement among OECD countries. So the documentation that I've provided here shows correspondence. There's one set here that starts with a February 25th, 1992 memo. This shows the correspondence between the Central Bank of Nigeria and us about repaying to the Central Bank of Nigeria the $1.2 billion in the official buyback. Another uh, bit of documentation concerns us retiring all of the promissory notes that we purchased on behalf of the Central Bank of Nigeria. The total, as I said, was about 1.1 billion. It's 1 billion, 90 million. This is the documentation where we canceled all these promissory notes with Chase Manhattan Bank, who was the agent for the central bank's notes. <coughs> the third group, the multilateral credits, what happened on these is we would present to the central bank the promissory notes or the debt instruments <coughs> that were entered into by the Ministry of Finance in Nigeria, and the central bank would cross those off their debt log. That was the 450 million. These were just simple receipts that gave the promissory notes. And those are the, th since those are the three main areas we bought debt in, or the only three areas we bought debt in, I provided you the documentation to show how the Central Bank of Nigeria got all their debt back, all their money back in the buyback to finish this whole operation. Uh, we were basically finished with this operation in 1992, uh, except for these multilateral credits that came up. There were a number of ones that came up, and so this was an opportunity uh, for the central bank to buy some more debts, and some of the prices paid on this multilateral credits were high, relatively speaking. Some of them were over 50 cents on the dollar. 52 cents on the dollar, I think, was the highest one. The reason those debts were higher <coughs> the ones that we bought to, at 50 or 52 cents on the dollar, these were very short-term debt instruments. In fact, uh, we were in the middle of buying 100 million French francs from a French company named Kofas, and they, they, they canceled uh, the operation temporarily because they presented the note for payment at the central bank that was due, and they got 100 cents on the dollar. So, Paying 52 cents on the dollar for something that in six months' time or in three months' time, the central bank's got to pay 100 cents on the dollar is not, a, is not a stupid move on our part or the central bank's part. It is a prudent economic step. I'm aware that the central bank of Nigeria has been silent in large part about this debt buyback. They have prepared at least two reports already. They have prepared a third report, which I know two weeks ago they gave to uh, IBB. Who, who requested this report from the central bank? Babangida. Yes. In this report, this is a report the central bank intends to submit to the Senate if they're called to, to do this. But why should I? Because he asked them for it, and this was under his regime. So, you know, he's being asked to account for this, and uh, I think you've read the news accounts that he has massive documentation from his time in office, but the central bank gave him this report just recently. And in it, the central bank says this was this one of the best economic decisions that the government of Nigeria ever made to, con to do this debt buyback. So that's, for the moment, that's all I really have to say about it. Uh, I would be happy to answer the questions from uh, my two uh, distinguished panelists here and then take the questions from the audience. How here? chart and I just want you to take a look at it to uh, see whether because I'm going to ask some questions yeah. based on what I've called the debt buyback maze yes Nigeria is the debtor and right. there are a number of creditors here yes. number of promissory notes right and you live in this universe here somewhere Yes. A dead buyback firm. Right. Okay. And there are several actors, banks, some others, Jeffrey Schmitz, or friends. Yeah. What do you know about this investment company, Predelect? 
Okay. In terms of all that has happened. Okay. That's one. That's that's a question I want you to hold on to. Okay. So because there is some oh, oh sorry. Somebody's <coughs> tape recorder just yeah, stopped no, here. In this one. So uh, I want you, you to because Predilect did not sh show up in any of your statements. Yes. And I, I want you to be able to make some statement about that. Yeah. Now, that's one. Two is the fact that um, in part of the fashion report, uh, there is something here you, which I don't think is in here. Shows sources of funds from March 1929, 1988 yeah. to 31st December 1991. Yes. Same. Uh, these numbers look correct. Mm -hmm. And between 1988 and 1991, there were 315 days. 315 days. Uh, Goes all the way to right. yeah, and this this this, this are authentic. Uh -huh. Three hundred and fifteen deals that were worth one point one billion dollars. Uh, no, three. Uh, they cost. The, the cost. cost. The cost. Three point four billion dollars worth of debt. It, the, but but the cost it cost one point one. 1. Right. <coughs> now between January nineteen ninety two and March nineteen ninety three. Yes. There were ten more. There were 10, ten more deals. 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 And those 10 cost 1.7 billion. Because what you have shown here, this, the cost here is 2.8. Right. And this one here, this one here is 1.1. 1. 1. 1. So okay. within about 10 to 15 <clears throat> months, 10 deals cost 1.7 billion dollars. While within five years, 315 deals cost 1.1. Yeah. I, I'm not saying anything is wrong, but obviously the rate at which this thing acceleration. With the acceleration within that period was substantial. Was substantial. Well, so that, uh, and I have a thought, a thought question, and I will leave it. Okay. I'll leave it. One of the you had indicated that Noga. You had indicated that Noga. Uh, Noga was one of the steel, the Ajakuta steel company uh, suppliers. suppliers so that um, the steel company Ajakuta owed money to. Uh, it's it's a it's a this Hungarian company. Yeah. Okay. No. Now. In your own deals, in the file, there are three government deals that were to know that. Right. $326 million. Dollars, right. Okay. I just want to explain, because between your own deals and the Ajakuta steel, the only link is that Noga right. person, that Noga group of people. Yeah. I just, at some point, want you to address that, that issue. issue. Okay. Okay. Um, well, can I, can I just want to include my questions so you can deal with them you know, straight away? Okay, let me first. Excuse me, that's enough. Can I bring my perspective for us when we get to No, 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 no. Oh, 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 oh. That's too much. This is reasonable. No, no, no. This is reasonable. I'm not actually I'm already. I'm actually reasonable. Some of us came here, we thought there was a panel. Listen to the panel and then have opportunity. If uh, the format was that you are going to be cross-examining and then then they come with the, you know that you know. I, 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 I think, so uh, when, uh, when I started, uh, this was the uh, format. Understand that some of us have some of the information before now. So before you came in, that was the format. There will be enough time. Can you give me perspective, please? Let's have this done properly because I know what can happen. We will. I mean, we know what there are lots of passions here. Let's move forward. Because I don't have so many questions to ask. Correct. We can speak into it. Okay. Let me let me ask let me answer these three questions. Yes. Can I answer these three questions first? Yes. 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 
Okay, first, first, uh, the first one I'm going to answer is the 1.2 billion versus uh, 2.8 billion. Well, I I've already explained that uh, because what we've added in between the December 91 report and the March 93 report is the 1.2 billion in the official buyback. See, all of the bank debt we acquired, we sold and we received $1.2 billion from it. And we gave it back to the central bank. So it inflates both sides of the sources and uses of funds by $1.2 billion. Now, the other, the other major factor is the total amount of interest there is $300 million. And here we have another, uh, another $164 million since then for a total of $464. So it's another $160. So the total of those two is $1.2 or six billion, almost 1.5 billion. So that's the difference there, uh, by and large. You know, 1.2 versus 2.8 is 1.6. If we go through the rest of it, you can see what these other charges are that add up to that. Okay. Okay. So that's the first question. It's it's the the 1.2 billion that's on the sources and uses of fund statements that resulted from the official buyback. All it does is inflate both sides of the equation. The the the. First question had to do with Predilect Investments Limited. Predilect was a company, and I've got some documentation here for you about Predilect. Uh, there's a sector in this green packet that has at the front of it a thing called discharge. And behind that you will see uh, two letters from NNPC and a contract we made with NNPC on January the 1st, 1989. Now, the discharge is uh, a statement from NNPC which says that everything you promised to do for us for $30,000 a quarter is done and completed. We got all our money and we're happy with what you did for us. Their Predilect Investment Limited was set up as the vehicle which NNPC used to buy uh, bank debt in the market or under a repurchase agreement, uh, well, not under a repurchase agreement, but with a tacit understanding between the central bank and NNPC that central bank would buy that debt from them when they were ready, when the central bank was ready. Now, the second page of that section, there's a letter from NNPC to uh, another player in this thing, Centropriv Zurich. Central Proof Zurich was a, is a subsidiary, or was a subsidiary, it may still be, a Swiss bank corporation. It's, it's the company that managed the corporate affairs of Predilect Investments Limited for NNPC. At the time, we were transferring uh, 941 notes that NNPC bought from the Central Bank of Nigeria that had a face value of $876 million. This was a borrowing arrangement that the Central Bank of Nigeria entered into with NNPC independent of us, although we helped orchestrate it because we held the notes for NNPC. In order to satisfy the Swiss Bank Corporation subsidiary, they asked uh, NNPC to write them a letter confirming that they had full knowledge of the fact that NNPC was transferring all these promissory notes that were held in the name of Predilect to our U.S. company called Shamrock Financial Corporation. And this was the instruction from NNPC to Centropriv AG, AG to, uh, sorry, this was the instruction from NNPC to Centropriv AG authorizing that and further it states, you are authorized to accept instructions for the liquidation of Predilect Investments Limited and another corporation you haven't mentioned, Trolion General Corporation, the holding company of Predilect Investments Limited from Jeffrey L. Schmidt and Robert S. Minton. So Predilect and, and the holding company that was set up to own Predilect for NNPC, because NNPC held the shares in Trolion, those two had finished their purpose once those notes were transferred back to us and it was liquidated. And the instructions to liquidate it uh, may be in here, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was liquidated after NNPC found that Predilect had finished its purpose, which was this limited operation 
between Predilect, uh, between Central Bank and NNPC directly. Okay. So that's who Predilect is. Okay. No go. Okay. okay. There were uh, there were three or four transactions. Uh, they're on this list. You'll see them referred to as Noga something. Uh, these were transactions whereby that came to us not from uh, not from uh, Nessim Gallon. We did have contact with Nessim Gallon, but these transactions came to us from the central bank. You know, these were transactions where. Uh, Gowan had in one way or another injected himself into these three uh, places in Hungary. Uh, I believe Czechoslovakia was another one. Sorry, who, who, who did you say was? Gowan? Gowan, that seems Gowan. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what did you think I said? I thought it was uh, Gowan. We have another head of state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, sorry. Not him, not him. This, this is Nessim Gowan. Yeah, the Jewish guy. Yeah. In, there were three of them, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, that was one. Uh, Hungary, another Hungary, and another Hungary. So it was Hungary and Czechoslovakia were the, were the four transactions that totaled this $326 million. Uh, these were all uh, relatively short-term credits. Uh, you know, Central Bank had to pay these things fairly soon. The, the prices that Gowan got for these notes were market prices. You can look at the prices there. You know, he didn't get any sweetheart deals. Uh, and Governor Ahmed was really uh, particular that, that Gowan, when he negotiated with us, got a fair market price, not any sweet deals. So we did those uh, transactions because they were presented to us by the central bank and they had substantial debt involved, $300 million, and they were purchased at prices that are at market. Uh, certainly nothing uh, substantial. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. I, 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 I'll I, ask some questions, then we'll give some Well, my, my questions are not as technical as, because if you're, if you've not been following this thing as we have, you're more likely you know, to be lost. So, so um, I want to bring those, you know, back to, you know, the question I want to ask, um, when I spoke with Pasha um, and his investigation, um, two questions. They said, um, Mr. Meeting's accounts have been frozen. And I believe that um, if, uh, for some reason, um, well, amongst other accounts, frozen in Nigeria, no, abroad, okay. in foreign bank accounts. Um, so the question I'm going to ask, the first one is, have your bank accounts been frozen, whether in Nigeria or in Togo or in anywhere. Austria? Or anywhere. Anywhere. That's one. Um, the other thing is, um, you've tried to explain um, or to, to um, deny allegations of impropriety. And the question is, what exactly, why would John Fashan keep all these allegations on you? Because um, if he's taking so much trouble to prepare what he calls the Fashan report, which is this thing, and um, quite frankly, he's saying that you've been involved in some shady deals, why would he do something like that? So, those three questions. Okay. Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I don't have any accounts anywhere in the world that have been frozen by anybody. It is a complete fabrication that Fashionu and his investigators continue, uh, even in, as late as yesterday, to uh, uh, report. It's just not true. Uh, secondly, why is this group of people that Fashionu is involved in after me, and is Fashionu after me? You know, you've seen maybe some of the things that I posted, or one thing I posted on the internet, I mentioned briefly that the Church of Scientology is somehow involved in this. Well, that may not make any sense to anybody in this room, but uh, when, uh, when the award was given out to uh, its distinguished recipient earlier today, uh, she talked about freedom of speech, uh, 
freedom of belief, human rights, suffering, and I have been for the last five years engaged in basically what the Church of Scientology considers an all-out war. The Church of Scientology does everything they can in this country to suppress free speech if that speech is negative towards the Church of Scientology. There, there are two people here in this room who have had who collectively 25 years inside the Church of Scientology who can tell you more about this than I can. I do know a lot about it, but I'm not going to belabor this point too much right now. But Jesse Prince, who some of you may have met, uh, was the number two man in this organization uh, for some years. Uh, Stacy Brooks was also right at the top of this organization, uh, working for the man who is currently the head of it. In uh, 1997, a man named uh, David Lee, whose real name is David LeBeau, began as part of an investigation team working for the Church of Scientology to, invest, to investigate me on five different continents, all places where I've worked, in South America, North America, in Europe, in Africa, and in Asia, in Turkey specifically, uh, Asia Minor. Okay. Uh, he, together with a team of people in London, have been working full-time for three years now, digging up information on me. They have tried to implicate me in a huge financial scandal, which they said brought down the Turkish government. You know, I am what the Church of Scientology calls a merchant of chaos. You know, going around the world, destabilizing governments. <laughs> this is their belief. Uh, they didn't succeed in any other attempt so far to smear my reputation so that I no longer speak out against their human rights, abuse and their attacks on civil liberties here in the United States and in Europe. David Lee is Robert Clark, who is John Fashionu's investigator. John Fashionu is a man who has no scruples whatsoever. He, he supported the Abacha regime in Nigeria when the Million Man March was organized by General Abacha, and he went to Nigeria and he spoke in favor of Abacha. Today, John Fashionu is trying to paint himself as some sort of national hero. Well, John Fashionu has been paid, in my opinion, by the Church of Scientology to put this report in the public domain. John Fashionu cannot answer a single question competently about anything he says in this report. One of the documents that was shown, uh, you were showing me that $1.1 billion or $1.2 billion in December 91, those documents that John Fashionu has included in his report were stolen from the office of Jeff Schmidt in London, England in December 1998 by the Church of Scientology. Everything that John Fashionu has done with this so-called Fashionu report is a fraud and he is working for money for the Church of Scientology. That's why uh, this Fashionu report exists. That's why John Fashionu appears to be after me. They're not interested in Jeff Schmidt. They're not interested in uh, Bob Smith or anybody else who was involved in this debt buyback. They are specifically targeting a man who the Church of Scientology wants to eradicate as their number one public enemy in the world. That's, that's what I have to say about that. Okay.